Before we state and prove the implicit function theorem, we're going to have a little pre-implicit function theorem, uh, and we'll actually view the implicit function theorem as a converse of this statement. And for the precise details of the statement and proof of the theorem, actually we'll be able to prove it pretty precisely, but for the statement I refer you to the notes. For now I just want to illustrate a picture for what the statement is, and we'll focus on that picture to understand exactly what the assumptions are. So we're going to focus on a particular function that's defined on a subset of RK cross RN. And it's going to be defined specifically on a product of an open subset of RK and an open subset of RN. And the reason for this is somewhat technical. Uh, it, sh it should be ideal if we can do this for an arbitrary open set, but for a simplicity of the proof and statement, we'll just make it um, an arbitrary product of open sets. So here we have an open subset, let's say U of R, K, and here, let's say we have an open subset V in R, N. And so the product looks something like this uh, sort of rectangle. It's not literally a rectangle because remember if I could draw more dimensions more easily, U could look like an oblong shape in, in K dimensions and so could V. So this could be some strange shape. But uh, visually, if we're just dealing with K and N equal to 1, it looks like um, just an ordinary rectangle. But even if k was equal to 2, for instance, you could imagine that u was even an open disk, and this would look more like a cylinder. So anyway, we have a function that's defined um, on this domain, and it maps to Rm. That's an m here, not an n. And let's just draw the codomain just for, just so that we know, not the codomain, sorry, the range. Let's say the range is something like this. If these open sets were, um, were connected, then this would also be a connected subset. Suppose, besides just having this function, that there exists an open subset of U, let's call it B. So B is an open subset of RK, but it's also in U and a function g from this open subset to Rn. So I'll draw this like this, but because of the way I've drawn this picture, we can visualize the function g in terms of its graph by looking at the points x comma gx. So here, let me draw the domain and let me draw the, let me draw the range here. So these are both, we assume also that not only is G defined on a domain that's inside of U, we also assume that the range of G is inside of V. So that the graph is completely contained in the original open set that we started with. Now, so let's draw this graph. Let's say this graph looks something like this. And we assume that f applied to this graph gives us 0. So we assume that, so let's call this here, this is the graph of g, and it's denoted with a gamma, gamma of g. And it equals the set of points x comma gx such that x is in the domain b. So assume that f applied to this graph is 0. And also assume that these functions are continuously differentiable. And in fact, if we wanted to, we can also assume 
that both f and g are of class CR. So that means they are R times differentiable and those R th derivatives are also continuous. In fact, all partial derivatives are continuous up until the Rth ones and including them. So these are the assumptions in the theorem. What's the conclusion? Then it turns out that we can take any derivative differential at this point, we can decompose it, so we can look at our function here. I'll zoom in a little bit so that I can draw the vectors a little bit more clearly. And we have our domain. Now we don't need to look at the domains u and v anymore. We can just focus on the domain b. Let's say b looks something like, let's say b is from here to here. We can take any point x in our domain b. Let me just draw the graph a little bit bigger. Let's draw the graph. Maybe it looks something like this. I picked a pretty bad point x to illustrate what I want to show. So let me pick another point. Let's say the point x is here. Let's say that's x. Let's not look at that one. So, um, and here's the range. So we can draw the range. We can make sure it's somewhere here. So take an arbitrary vector at x. Now the differential of g takes this vector and maps it to a vector from, so this is a vector in rk, this is v in rk, and in fact we think of it as being at the point x. And we'll look at the differential of g at x applied to the vector v, this gives us some vector in the range, in the codomain of that differential. Of, of that differential. And what is that? So the value of the function is somewhere here. This is g of x. And the vector gets sent to something. Let me just draw. I know what it gets sent to it from the picture, we can tell. It's essentially, in one dimension, it's the slope. So this is dx g applied to v. And when I look at both of these vectors, when I draw the graph and I draw the this like tangent slope, this vector here, this slope of this curve is equal to the sum of these two vectors when viewed as being inside of the full vector space of Rk and Rn. So this vector here is v comma dx g applied to v. And you can check, right? All we do is, you know, we do this, we decompose this vector, and the vector is decomposed into its two parts. The statement of the, the by the way, we haven't even made the statement of the theorem yet. The statement of the theorem that under these assumptions, then the claim is that this composite vector here gets sent to the zero vector under the differential of f at this point, which is x comma gx. So the statement is that under d applied to the point x gx of the function f applied to this vector here, and remember this has to make sense, right? f is a function from an open subset of rk cross rn to rm, so its output should be an m component vector and its input has to be an k plus n component vector, and that's exactly what this is, dxg v equals zero. So that's, that's the claim of the theorem. Equivalently, we can write this in a different way in terms of functions that sort of map these planes to the point x comma gx. And it's important to introduce this notation, so we might as well do it. So for any pair of points, let's say x comma y, where the first 
component is in Rk and the second vector is in Rn, we can define two functions and these functions are functions from Rk to Rk cross Rn and from Rn to Rk cross n for any fixed point x, y. And let's call this one phi y and this one psi x. And what this function does is it includes the plane that has k dimensions at the point x, y, and the plane is parallel to the r, k plane in here. So I'll, I'll draw a picture in a moment. The definition of this map is it sends x or any, any x, it doesn't have to be this x, it could be x prime, to x prime y. And this sends y, let's call it y prime to not confuse ourselves with the fact that this is a fixed x, y. It sends y prime to x comma y prime. What do these functions look like in a specific example? Let's just consider the case of k equals 2 and n equals 1, because that's the only um, case that I can draw that's at least more than one dimension each. So for this, let's draw the Euclidean 3 space and k equals 2 and let's pick an x, y that's say, let's say it's somewhere here. So it's got some non-zero x and y and z components. So this is x, y, and x is equal to x1, x2, and the third component's y. The first function here, what it does is it takes any value of x. So that means it takes in two variables and it maps it to the plane at height y. So it takes this plane way down here. This is one way you can think of this. It takes this entire plane down here and it shifts it up so that it's exactly matching the height of this point. So this is the plane. This is the image of the function phi y. This is the image. What about psi x. In this case, we only have a function of a single variable and we can think of it as mapping from this vertical axis also to the point x, y, but this time the only thing that's changing is y. So the image of that is exactly this line that pierces through this plane and it pierces through exactly at this point. It goes through the plane and it keeps going down all the way to infinity and likewise up. So this vertical line is the image of psi x in this picture. So this is sort of a generalization of where we just looked at taking a point and looking at the axis drawn through it. What we're doing here now is we're taking not just an axis and drawing, looking at functions that provide us axes, we're also looking at functions that sort of provide us with hyperplanes that go through the particular point that we're interested in. Why would we want to do this? Well, it's going to be helpful in this theorem because the claim can be rewritten using exactly these functions. And how can it be rewritten? Well, here we have, all we're doing is we're pushing forward this vector here. That's kind of like what we're doing in this case. We're sort of shifting our plane and we're pushing forward this vector and we're also pushing this forward vector here inside this bigger space. It's just a formal way of mathematically and precisely explaining this picture. So then um, what we can do is we can rewrite this claim in the form that the derivative at x gx of the function f composed with pushing forward any vector 
into the first slot, that would be saying take the differential at the point x and applying the function phi at gx. And the second component is adding, well, what are we adding? We have to push forward the vector v as well, so we have to keep that in mind. Ignoring this, think of this as a single vector for now. Call it w if it helps. And we're using this other function at the point gx, this other function psi x, and we're pushing forward this vector w, um, and this vector w is obtained by first composing with the function, the differential of g at x. So our claim can be rewritten by saying that the composition of these two functions is equal to the zero linear transformation. It's another way of expressing this exact same equation, but in terms of the abstract linear transformations instead of how they act on a specific vector.